Oh, well. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Stuart Corbridge. I'm the Deputy Director and Provost here at LSE. It's really a great pleasure and honour to welcome you to the school for this evening's inaugural lecture by Professor Nigel Dodd on the topic of the social life of money. Um, now is the time, please, if you could just make sure that your mobile devices are turned to silent. But if you do want to tweet about tonight's event, the hashtag is LSE Money. Uh, it's a very special night tonight, being an inaugural lecture, and yeah, you have to turn yours off, Keith, as well. I'm going to come to Professor Hart in a minute. Uh, tonight's talk is sponsored, obviously, by the Department of Sociology at the school, which is where uh, Professor Dodd, Dodd Holt is chair. Nigel's been working on the sociology of money at least since the time of his PhD at Cambridge at the end of the 1980s and early into the early 1990s. And we're just talking in the green room about his viva, which was an interesting one, clearly. Although he'll also be well known to some audience members for his work more broadly in economic sociology and contemporary social thought, including work on Benjamin and Foucault. Uh, his first two books, both published by Polity Press, were respectively The Sociology of Money, which I think is a very good book, and Social Theory and Modernity. But tonight, of course, Nigel will be developing arguments from his new book, The Social Life of Money, which was published just last month by Princeton University Press. There are copies outside. You will be able to buy them later and get them signed at the end of the lecture by Nigel here on stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I have to confess, I just did to Nigel, that this is a book that I really do want to read, uh, presumably over the uh, Christmas vacation, although I do have Piketty in front of you, Nigel, and it's a, it's a fairly large tome, as many of us know. Uh, but I am looking forward to reading the book. I mean, if you look at how it's been described by really good people, uh, people think of it as a hugely original contribution to the ways that we might think about money, not just in, in the wake of the global financial crisis or the global financial mess, but also as a set of claims on society that are made by some and not others on the basis of very different accounts of the legitimacy of issuing and regulating currency and other means of exchange. So this is restoring a much older and very important discourse on the meanings of money. Nigel's going to speak for around 40 to 45 minutes, and as soon as he sits down, I'm going to ask Professor Keith Hart to act as our first respondent for about 20 minutes before opening up to the floor for questions. Uh, Keith is currently a centennial professor of economic anthropology here at the school, but in the Department of International Development. Uh, many of you, probably everyone in the audience, will know Keith, uh, particularly for his work on the informal economy. He's also been working for many years on money in an unequal world, and most recently on what is called the end of all purpose money in the, po in the world post-2008. We were just chatting in the green room that Nigel and Keith are teaching a course together this term in international development. One thing for sure, we're in for a, a very lively evening. So, Nigel, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, I think you can hear me, so uh, I'm going to try. Ah, yeah, it works. Good. Right. Okay. I'm ready. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I feel humble um, before you, so I'll just get going and uh, see how we get on. Um, good. This does work. Excellent. Okay. When I was a student, um, I had a summer job uh, as a guard in the back of a securicore lorry. Um, they called it the bullion van and it carried vast amounts of cash between banks on the south coast of England and a depot somewhere near London. <coughs> this depot was something li like something out of a James Bond movie, but it was located underground, and we backed the lorry up against huge, shiny metal doors. As the doors opened, a group of people in white boiler suits <coughs> would emerge, and we'd go through the complicated procedure of opening the back of the bullion van, which involved two airlocks and a great deal of patience. Once everything was open, they would load our bags of cash onto a trolley and disappear into what looked like a labyrinth of safe deposit stores. My job that summer was to sit in the back of this van for around 12 hours each day, guarding a growing pile of cash. 
They <coughs> even gave me a big stick, just in case someone managed to get in, although for the life of me, I couldn't work out how. There were no proper windows, no mobile phones, and no Kindles, and I was trying to give up smoking at the time. <laughs> All I could do on those long journeys back to London was stare at bags of money. These were purple, with a NatWest logo, and each one contained around £250,000. One day, I started piling them up to make a mattress, which I reckoned was worth about £4 million. From now on, every afternoon, I would lay down on my cash mattress <laughs> and sleep. I sometimes wonder whether this was when my interest in the social life of money began. Although the amount of money I was seeing each day soon became quite meaningless, I never stopped being fascinated by the mechanics of money. It had never occurred to me before to ask how money travelled between banks, for example. And I rather liked the fact that there were huge underground vaults inhabited by people in white boiler suits like Oompa Loompas, pushing trolleys of cash around. What I was seeing and participating in with my big stick and my cash mattress was the infrastructure of the formal cash economy and the huge effort and cost evolved, involved in moving money around. That vault probably still operates, but its importance relative to all of the money that moves around the country today has surely been reduced. Cash is still used in Britain today, although in less than 3% of transactions, and much of the cash that moves around consists of very large denominations, which suggests that fewer and fewer people are using cash on an everyday basis. Today's monetary infrastructure consists of the terminals, wires, and data banks that keep digital money on the move. An important part of this normally invisible infrastructure was rudely exposed in the UK on Monday when the Clearing House Automated Payment System, or CHAPS, used for large payments like house purchases, broke down. The results were tangible as removal vans sat on driveways and estate agents and lawyers waited for payments to clear. This is the social life around money, the life that sustains it and is sustained by it, with its complex chains of interconnections. In the usual scheme of things, most of us don't spend much time thinking about the social life of money. We may worry about how much of it we have, or how much we need, or how we are going to make it last, but we rarely think about how it works or what it is. If we do so, as many people did on Monday, it is usually a sign that something has gone wrong. We're used to thinking that money is an impersonal, objective thing. What did you learn about money at school? Were you taught how banking works? Were you given lessons in the theory of value alongside history, physics, and biology? I'm not talking about financial literacy here, but deeper questions about something all of us use all of the time, but barely understand. Surely questions about the nature of money are fundamental to any form of inquiry into how the world works. In the UK, for example, most children in state schools spend a term aged around nine or 10 studying The Wizard of Oz. It's a great story, but they're rarely, if ever, told that Frank Baum conceived it as an allegory of money. And they're never encouraged to ask what those yellow bricks might be on the road that Dorothy has to follow, or why only silver shoes will take her home. Money seems to be invisible in that story, even though it can be found everywhere you look, just as it is hidden from questioning in our daily lives. But in recent years, it has become more and more difficult to keep the social life of money a secret. A number of things have happened to change this. One, quite obviously, is the financial crisis. In its aftermath, things happened whose mechanics we were not invited to question too closely. Quantitative easing wasn't explained very clearly, for example, although there were leaflets and infographics available for anyone who asked. But this wasn't really the point. What the crisis did was begin to focus attention on big questions about monetary governance, about who has the right to create money, where its value comes from, and how exactly debt works 
when it became clear that the world, or at least the bank, seemed to owe itself more money than it had ever produced. What also began to become clear as a direct result of the crisis were connections between the financial world, which can so easily seem distant and divorced, and the everyday. When people started to lose jobs, local government services ceased, and libraries closed as a result of austerity measures that were deemed to be necessary because of the financial crisis. It was little wonder that the question J.K. Galbraith had once asked about money, whence it came, where it went, became more and more compelling. This seemed to be a crisis of legitimacy as much as economics, provoked by the contrast between the resources that governments devoted to rescuing banks on the one hand and their willingness to make socially corrosive cuts in public expenditure on the other. The crisis polarised every society affected by it, giving birth to a meme, the 99%, that was inextricably tied to rising resentment and hostility towards Wall Street. The question of who pays goes to the heart of issues about how society organises its money, raising profound questions about power, freedom, justice and law. Zimmel once described money as a claim upon society. By doing so, he captured the sense in which the monetary system must be underpinned by trust, not merely between particular individuals, but also across society as a whole. This is what I am calling the social life of money, and it is being eroded by a system that allows immensely profitable banks to remain solvent at the public's expense. This erosion places the monetary system itself configured around the state's special rights over the definition and production of money under serious questioning. The crisis exposed the social life of money in other ways too. Look carefully at this picture. What started out as a banking crisis mutated into a sovereign debt crisis in the Eurozone. In Greece, one of the peripheral countries worst hit by rising debt, people started withdrawing euros from banks and hiding them in freezers and vacuum cleaners because they feared that the country would withdraw from the Eurozone and convert their bank balances into a new currency that would be worth less. Banks suddenly became the least secure places to keep your money as people found ingenious ways of concealing their cash. As a result, domestic burglaries shot up as thieves looked for the proverbial cash under the mattress. What it meant not only for money to have value, but for people to have money, was being placed in question. Attitudes towards money preceding long cyclical swings, Galbraith once said. When it is good, they think of other things. When it is bad, they think of little else. My aim in writing The Social Life of Money was to stand back and reconsider the nature of money, particularly its social nature, particularly it, partly in response to these events. But I didn't want to write just another critique of the banking system. In any case, this isn't why I started to write the book, which was before the crisis even began. When I started the book, I was responding to a different set of developments that had been going on for some time, although they have certainly accelerated since 2008. When I spent that summer riding around the back of the bully, in the back of a bullion van, sleeping on my mattress of cash, it was easy to think of money as something singular. In the advanced capitalist countries, we were still living in the era, era of state monopoly currency. So not only was cash more prevalent than it is today, but national currencies were too. But since that time, we have been witnessing something of a monetary revolution. There are three main arguments in the book that address this revolution. The first is about what money is. I argue that money is a process, not a thing, whose value comes from its qualities as a social relation. Money is shaped from the inside by the social practices of its users. The great sweeping historical associations between money and gold and between money and the state are inessential. It can exist without them as much as their structures linger. Money is not necessarily a creature of the state, nor must it be a form of credit that is created by banks. Culture, moreover, is not exogenous to money. We have access to a diverse range of monetary definitions and we should embrace that diversity. The second argument is about the relationship between money and society. Here I take Zimmel's great description of money as a claim upon society. 
but give it an important twist. When Zimmel described money in this way, he used his own very specific notion of society. This, does, this term doesn't mean nation-state in his work, but rather a process which he called association. By exploring the social life of money, I'm drawing attention to the sense in which money's value, indeed its very existence, rests on social relations between its users that are fluid and dynamic, just as Zimmel would have described. My third argument is about what money should be. As I just said, the era in which money was defined by the state is coming to an end. Alternative currencies are growing at an astonishing rate today. And we need a greater range of conceptual tools in order to understand them. We also need to understand, and the book argues very strongly for this, that there are myriad ways of organizing our money, not just one correct way. Money can be organized differently by small groups and communities, nations or groups of nations, private organizations, and so on, according to what it is needed for. Some forms of money are designed to counter forms of social financial exclusion, while others are designed to bring communities together or to bypass the constraints associated with major institutions such as banks and states. There isn't one money that can do all of these things. In the future, we will become more and more used to interacting with a variety of different monies. At the same time, it is important to understand that monetary pluralism isn't exactly new. Prior to the modern era, before the late 19th century and even later, it was common for people to encounter many different forms of money and to have to navigate the relationship between them in their everyday lives. Moreover, in many countries outside of the global <coughs> north, monetary multiplicity is simply a fact of life. If anything, then, what we are seeing is simply a return to the past. Even so, the changes we are witnessing now are potentially quite radical, not least because of the technology they involve, Bitcoin being just one example. When I sat down to write The Social Life of Money, I hoped to get to grips with these developments, and perhaps more importantly for me, their intellectual corollary. Just as we were witnessing a proliferation of monetary forms, so I could see a vast and varied literature growing right across the social sciences that was investigating the nature of money. Since I'd started working in the field in the early 1990s, there had been a tremendous explosion of interest in money as a social, political, and cultural, not just economic phenomenon. There are some fantastic scholars working on money, and I hope that my book reflects the energy of an ever-changing field. At the same time, however, I also sensed that there were too many scholars who were simply not engaging with each other, but limiting their engagements to their own niche within the field. I even found that there were disagreements about terminology. For example, what some scholars claimed was money, others said was merely currency, and sorting out a way through this conceptual thicket wasn't easy. So I wanted to write a book that brought the field together into a more coherent shape, not by synthesizing everything to, into a general theory, but pro by providing a framework in which different approaches can speak to each other, and their relative insights brought to bear on important questions. But it wasn't enough simply to review the specialist academic literature on money. I spend an awful lot of time reading and teaching social theory, so I'm aware that there are some great thinkers who have said fascinating things about money, but are rarely cited in the field. So I wanted to talk about these people too, thinkers such as Bataille, Baudrillard, Benjamin, Brown, Deleuze, Derrida, de Saussure, and Nietzsche, just to name a few. None of these is a monetary theorist, of course. You'd be hard pushed to take a Nietzschean line on the future of the US dollar. And you won't find much Derrida in the Financial Times. <laughs> when I searched the FT for Deleuze yesterday, it came back with the search query, did you mean deluxe? <laughs> yes, I, I suppose I must have done. But these thinkers have made some imaginative contributions to our conception of the nature and significance of money. To cite just one example of how such thinkers appear in the book, Walter Benjamin said some remarkable things about the symbolism of banknotes. And he wrote about the relationship between debt and guilt beautifully, which I explore at some length. As for Deleuze, or Deluxe, 
we should call him, the distinction he and Guattari drew between payment money and finance money is in fact quite interesting in the context of the Eurozone crisis. So throughout the book, I've tried to get these thinkers into a dialogue with the monetary specialists with some interesting results. The biggest challenge I faced when writing the book was to control all of this material. The categories I eventually came up with are, in my view, one of the best aspects of the book. The material is organized through eight interconnected chapters dealing with origins, capital, debt, guilt, waste, territory, culture, and utopia. Having a strong theme for each chapter provides a great focus and acts as a sorting device. To take just one example, the guilt theme allowed me to bring together Nietzsche with two of my favorite writers, Walter Benjamin and Norman Brown. Brown explores psychoanalytical associations between money and excrement. I promised that I wouldn't swear today. And connects them to a broader analysis of the role of debt in advanced capitalism. Guilt ties it all together and enables us to make connections with a fragment written by Walter Benjamin called Capitalism as Religion from 1921 in which the debt economy, he argues, rests on a Christian moral economy of guilt. It was Nietzsche who noticed that the German word for debt, schuld, also means guilt. Someone wrote to Paul Krugman about this double meaning, wasn't me, um, who responded, now it all makes sense. I mention this for two reasons. First, to show that these connections between debt and guilt are emerging from time to time in mainstream debates. The FT and The Economist have also carried articles about the relationship. Second, by the same token, I want to suggest that Krugman's observation would have been even better and much richer if he'd read Norman Brown. My other favorite challenging chapter of the book is the one on waste, where I bring in ideas from Bataille, Baudrillard, and Derrida. Here I explore what the theory of money might look like if we started not from the orthodox economics perspective that the economy deals fundamentally with the problem of scarcity, but from a different perspective, which is that our core economic problem is what to do with surplus. Bataille called this the theory of general economy. What would the theory of money look like if activities we usually think of as irrational or crazy, wasting it, burning it, gambling it, and so forth, were pushed to the very heart of economic analysis? How would debates about the Eurozone, for example, play out if the problem we started with was framed as a problem of surplus, not a problem of scarcity? The fact that it is almost impossible to imagine this without making moral judgments speaks volumes about the strength of the monetary paradigm we are caught up in, which begins with the problem of scarcity and treats frugality as inherently noble. One thing that emerges from such a discussion is that money can be celebrated as something joyful and irrational, emotional and personal, not just as cold, hard and impersonal. Think about your own relationship with money. When did you last give some money to someone as a gift? Would you give your mother or your father, your partner or your child a 50 pound note on their birthday? Have you ever burned money or frittered it away without feeling bad about it afterwards? Can you imagine being emotionally attached to a particular banknote or credit card. My daughter, when she was about five years old, received a cash prize one day for throwing a frisbee into a field of cows and guessing, uh, well, I, I won't swear again, but it's to do with excrement. <laughs> on taking her prize, because she got it spot on, I asked her what she wanted to spend the money on. She held up the banknote and declared that this was her prize. She was perfectly happy with it and would be holding on to it, thanks very much. I found myself giving her a lecture, trying to tell her that money doesn't work like that. Thanks very much. It's just interchangeable paper, worth only what you get for it. Then I realized <clears throat> that I was just reproducing, reproducing the ideology. Excuse me. 
But money is an impersonal thing, anonymous and cold, something that just mediates the exchange of commodities without having any real presence of its own in our economic lives. So I let her keep the banknote and bought her something else with my credit card. Theory only gets you so far. Now, when I asked my daughter if it was okay to tell this story, she cut me a deal. I could tell it if I buy her a new pair of jeans. So <laughs> that's the deal. She's sharp. Classical social thought was shaped by a view of money as a malevolent social force. Money was like acid, corrupting social life by turning it into a calculating, impersonal space in which increasingly we relate to each other only through economic exchange. Marx described money as a universal agent of separation, for example, while Max Weber said that it was the most abstract and impersonal element that exists in human life. Even Nietzsche got in on the act. Almost everything he said about money was negative. For example, as the educated classes are being swept along by a hugely contemptible money economy, he spat, the world has never been more worldly, never poorer in love and goodness. And Zimmel said that money makes us treat every social encounter as a mathematical problem. But although money has generally had a bad press from these thinkers, they had some good things to say about it too. Marx described money as the bond of all bonds, while Zimmel described it as a branch from the same root that produces all the other flowers of our culture. Even more strikingly, many of these thinkers suggested that money inspires feelings in us that are analogous to our feelings towards God. Marx compared money to Christ's representation of men before God, for example, while Nietzsche didn't only announce that God was dead, but argued that he'd been replaced by money. What one formerly did for the sake of God, he said, one now does for the sake of money. One of the most remarkable things about money is that it is capable of arousing these contrasting thoughts and feelings, fear and excitement, loathing and desire, disgust and awe. But these are not contradictions in our understanding of money that need to be ironed out by good theory. They are different sides of money that coexist simultaneously, enabling us to enjoy a relationship with it that is rich and rewarding and damaging and problematic. Alas, negative images of money still have populist appeal, as we saw with several books published in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Bestsellers such as How Much Is Enough by the Skidelskys and What Money Can't Buy by Michael Sandel lament our obsession with money as symptoms of a pathological society. Even Pope Francis joined the chorus of complaint against the cultural damage that can be inflicted by money, lambasting neoliberalism as the dictatorship of an economy without purpose nor truly human face, and arguing that the worship of the ancient golden calf has found a new and ruthless image in the fetishism of money. My point is that these negative images of money are not completely wrong but rather they are only barely half right. We need to challenge the knee-jerk image of money as a culturally destructive force. And one of the most important things I try to do in the book is bring out money's utopian sides. Usually, money features in utopia only by its absence. It is as if, by abolishing money, we could cure all kinds of social ills. Thomas More thought that by getting rid of money, we could bring an end to fraud, theft, burglary, brawls, riots, disputes, rebellion, murder, treason, and black magic. Plato compared money and usury to the raising of sordid beasts, while Proudhon thought that money should be gotten rid of because, like property, it was a form of theft. One might therefore imagine that utopianism isn't a very promising theme to pursue in a book about money, but on the contrary, there is a rich tradition of utopianism that is connected to money. What I'm referring to here are various schemes that connect monetary reform to social reform. Some critics think that is just naive. For example, John Kay wrote in the FT right here that monetary reformers are just cranks who think that by redesigning money you can transform the world. I don't think this criticism is fair because it preempts what should be a healthy conversation about how best to organize money in the future. 
I discuss a variety of utopian monies in the book. Each involves a distinct combination of aims and ideals. For example, John Ruskin's ideal of labour money, like the more recent time dollar, seeks to redesign money so as to ensure a just wage, according to a principle he refers to as giving time for time. Silvio Gazelle, on the other hand, was concerned with ensuring that money isn't hoarded, so he argued that it should be designed to rot like potatoes or rust like iron. Proudhon sought to make credit more widely available with his Bank of the People, while more recently the late Richard Douthwaite has proposed a form of ecological money in which currencies are backed by units of energy that are used to purchase emission rights. Utopianism is influencing the design of payment systems too, as we find creative and very practical ways of challenging the notion that money is an impersonal tool of payment that divides more than it unites those who use it. One of my personal favourites is the idea of hug and pay, as thought up by the artist Heidi Hinder. When you want to make a financial transaction, she says, you have to hug the cashier, which then triggers your payment. It is like a more physical manifestation of touching your oyster card on the reader. I'm a little nervous about this, but, but uh, we'll, we'll go with the flow for now. Um, we've also looked into a handshake, or a high five, or maybe a tap dance, a physical play on tap and pay. One can only speculate where such ideas might lead. Bitcoin is the most prominent example of an alternative currency, the wunderkind of the world's fast-changing monetary landscape. For its principal designer, the goal of the new currency was to establish a form of money in which there was no need for trust. Politically, Bitcoin resonates with the post-2008 Occupy movement, not just because it challenges the role of banks in creating money, but also due to its horizontalism. Like Twitter, Bitcoin epitomizes a brave new world of the network, governed not by central sources of authority, but by the wisdom of crowds. Perhaps the ultimate financial expression of such wisdom would be P2P lending, while the fast-growing sharing economy, couch surfing, for example, has taken the principle into the consumer world. Bitcoin belongs to this world, the only caveat being that it automates the crowd. But there are some curiosities in the image of money behind Bitcoin. Although it is a virtual currency, the philosophy behind it implies that we must think of money as a thing, an asset, whose value must be zealously protected over time. The language associated with Bitcoin, all that talk of mining and rigs, is metalist. <coughs> Bitcoin is designed to behave like gold, only better because its supply is absolutely fixed. The network is programmed to ensure that the total number of Bitcoins in existence will never exceed 21 million. For these two reasons, the absence of trust and the view of money as a thing, Bitcoin relies on an old-fashioned, even reactionary, image of money. The argument for Bitcoin's horizontalism is undermined by the way the system incentivizes the most powerful producers of the currency to become even more powerful. It is mathematically possible for one miner with enormous processing power to monopolize the creation of new coins. If this were to happen, Bitcoin would resemble the most hierarchical monetary system imaginable. And although it, the technology underpinning Bitcoin has a decentralized logic, its operational management and governance are only accessible to a small number of skilled programmers. Bitcoin, therefore, represents something of a paradox. While the theory behind it tells us that money is a thing like gold that can operate apart from the uncertainties of social life, the currency itself is being sustained by leadership, social organization, social structure, utopianism, and trust. Contrary to the, in the intentions of its designers, Bitcoin manifests forms of sociality and creativity that are crucial to the social life of money. As I said earlier on, we are living already in an increasingly pluralistic monetary world. Some of this is being generated by utopianism, but it would be naive of me to ignore the commercial agenda that is also driving the process of monetary diversification forward. 
As the everyday use of cash declines, the private payment services industry is making a grab for money's infrastructure. Social networking platforms and mobile phone companies are joining credit card companies, all vying for the 1% to 4% slice of every payment made. There are clear dangers here. Open access to payments technology, whether that technology consists of cash, plastic, or hug and pay, should be an integral part of the freedom that comes with using money. And that freedom should not be compromised by private interests. An important aspect of money's infrastructure is being potentially taken further away from, not closer towards, the civic benefits that are meant to accrue from the emergence of alternative monies. Hence, there are two basic trends in the ongoing transformation of money, which potentially are in tension. On the one side, money is being reinvented by critics of the financial system who are striving to develop viable alternative financial and monetary systems, from local money such as the Brixton Pound, through various forms of P2P lending such as Zopa, to digital currencies such as Bitcoin. On the other side, the payments industry is being transformed by private corporations who are acutely aware of the huge profits to be gained from owning a piece of the payments infrastructure. Just think of PayPal, Amazon, Google, Apple Pay, Square, and iZettle, just to name a few. To express this distinction crudely, the first development is utopian, the second capitalistic. There are some interesting crossovers and confusions between them, but there is a danger only a danger that they are taking us in different directions. The first celebrates money's essential sociality and seeks to be inclusive. The second privatizes money and is inherently exclusionary. On the 24th of May 2010, an American lawyer known online as Beowulf posted a comment on a discussion thread suggesting that the US Treasury could if it wanted, mint 12 one trillion dollar platinum coins and deposit them at the Federal Reserve in order to pay off the national debt by lunch. It was able to do this, he claimed, and he was right, because of a legal anomaly that gives the Secretary of Treasury power to fix a denomination on a platinum coin, no other metal, at any level he chooses. Less than three years later, Beowulf's idea of the $1 trillion platinum coin took on emblematic significance. Its use was widely discussed, even at the White House, as a means of evading political efforts to impose a ceiling on US public debt. A Twitter campaign to promote the idea, hashtag mint the coin, became a matter of passionate public debate and generated fierce doctrinal disputes between monetary experts about its plausibility and potential impact on inflation. Many dismissed the idea as juvenile and batty. Some saw the coin as a last-ditch means of avoiding America's fiscal cliff, while others read in the coin a Baudrillard-style subversion of monetary realism. Beowulf himself said that the idea began as a silly question and a, a deliberate absurdity. There's really no reason for a trillion dollar coin, he said. It's kind of sad that it's gone this far. Was hashtag mint the coin utopian? Well, perhaps it was, but surely it was no less utopian than to believe that America's $16 trillion debt would eventually be repaid, just as if it were a personal bank loan or a credit card bill. Though our national monetary systems were once captive to this premise, it is becoming increasingly difficult for governments and banks to sustain the illusion that money is a thing, an entity that can be acquired, accumulated, stored up, and ergo something that a country simply runs out of. A monetary crisis will always expose the social life of money, that is to say, the complex and dynamic configuration of social, economic, and political relations on which money depends. Such a crisis does not simply show money up for what it really is. More importantly, it reveals money for what it really is not. That is to say, it is not an objective entity whose value is independent of social and political relations. This is the underlying significance of the debate about the one trillion dollar coin. The very possibility that such a coin could be minted by popular demand 
and that it could indeed be used to redeem some of America's, some of America's public debt seem to reinforce the argument that money is a process, not a thing. When Nietzsche said that money had replaced God, he was referring to all that ever has been or ever could be subsumed in the name of God. All that remained, he said, was the contemptible money economy this would be home to the banker who is unable or unwilling to tell the difference between financial obligation and moral guilt. But as I hope I've shown here today, there is considerable life in the notion that money can be reclaimed from the grip of the banking system. This placard from an Occupy demonstration in Paternoster Square, we are the true currency, conveys the inspiring utopian message on which I would like to end. Money should be an embodiment of our common humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. I mean, some people drift away at the end. I just wanted to say before I hand over to Keith that it's really a very celebratory moment tonight uh, with Nigel doing his inaugural lecture. And I think it's very nice that a large number of colleagues from sociology are with us. I think your daughter is with us too, so hiding behind Pat and Claire. Um, so you, stuck a, you struck a good deal. Well done. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful that we're sort of reintroducing the idea of an inaugural lecture. But I have to say that I thought yours was profound, provocative, absolutely beautifully delivered. It was, it was wonderful. It was great. And we're going to have a celebration outside at the end. We're going to hear from Keith first and also take questions and answers. And it really does make me want to read the, the book. I mean, the geographer in me is also would want to say, if, maybe you did touch upon this, but I think when, with The Wizard of Oz, it was a critique of from the Midwest of New York, wasn't it? And yeah. OZ was NY at one remove, I think, in, in that famous book. <laughs> so thank you very much. We're, we're very lucky now that we have Keith Hart to deliver the formal response to Nigel, and then we'll move out into the audience. So, Keith, over to you, please. I think I'll, I'll stay here, do you think? Sure. Sure. <coughs> um, sure. Thanks. Well, this book, when I read it first, which was as a reviewer for the publisher, uh, was, um, it was just a joy to read. I mean, I never read a book about money that has so much uh, diversity and vitality in it. I mean, the I mean, the first thing that struck me was that a book about money is often about money as capital, money as currency, money as as debt. But as uh, uh, Nigel has pointed out, I mean, he has chapters on guilt and and waste, and uh, some really quite unusual people like Norman Brown, as he is very proud to remind us. Um, so the main point about this book is, is it isn't a textbook. It's, uh, it's a book <coughs> that is looking at money from so many points of view that it uh, essentially uh, speaks to a project that, that uh, we should go from knowing next to nothing about money to knowing everything that can be known about it. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a kind of encyclopedia of erudition. Uh, I can't summarize it, especially not after that lecture. Um, uh, I can tell you the bits that I like. I like the bits where he says, my work is very good. <laughs> 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 um, which is why we teach together. We <laughs> like each other. Um, no, it is, an, uh, I mean, it is written. It's, it's a work of great literary ar artifice. Uh, and, you know, as, he, as, 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 as Nigel just said, uh, uh, he's trying to put together things that are normally not put together. And, and the way you would read it, by the way, over the Christmas, you know, it really it is the thing you just kind of dip into and read a couple of pages and savor them. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't add up to a coherent uh, uh, approach to money. Quite, quite the opposite. It, it undermines every part of it that ra makes you feel that you're beginning to to get the point is then undermined by the next part that that gives you another point. And that you know that uh, may be a, a, a drawback to the book, but coming to it as I did. Uh, having immersed myself in this literature for so long, I simply say, I mean, I've never ever seen a book like it about money. And uh, that's what I said in my report, so they published it. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I was very pleased to see that, that they had a little uh, kind of ad in the London Review of Books and they used my quote uh, to illustrate the saleability of the book. <laughs> so I made it onto the pages of the London Review of Books. Um, now, what I just want to talk more about the context of this book because Nigel's book is not alone. It may be the best that I've seen so far, but there is an outpouring of books about money. I mean, they're coming out uh, at a tremendous rate. I mean, not. I mean, the fact that Piketty's monstrous book is uh, at least acknowledged by many people, even if they don't read it. Uh, uh, I mean, there are there are any number of these. I mean, I I I have a Kindle. I love Kindles and. Uh, and half the contents are Scandinavian crime fiction, and the other half are books on money. <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess I need one in order to sustain the other. <laughs> uh, um, so, I mean, the question I want to ask is why are we, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we're living in a golden age of books about money. I mean, I could name a dozen really excellent new books of the last few years, um, but of course I won't. So, uh, um, now the answer, I think, now the, this is a bit of a stretch, I'm sure. Uh, I think we're coming to the end of a phase in the history of money. And, uh, and, and that people know fundamentally, even if most of us are trained not to think about money except in the most idiotic and superficial way, uh, we, we all have this, uh, we have um, uh, some knowledge that the system of money has gone wrong. And it's not just... Uh, a moment in the cycle of credit and debt, or even you know, um, banks fiddling LIBOR and and all that kind of thing. Uh, I believe it is the case that we're coming to the end of modern money, and uh, this is a process that was initiated uh, 40 year or more years ago. Uh, when uh, the American dollar was taken off gold by Nixon. So it's not something that's happening recently or uh, that was uh, initiated uh, by the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Um, uh, so what is it that's ending? My, my, my argument is that, that the system of money that we have lived by, especially in the 20th century, almost universally, is now all washed up. And I call that system of money national capitalism. Uh, now, national capitalism is uh, the aim to manage markets, money, and accumulation through central bureaucracy in the interests of a national citizen body. And as a, 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 a uh, a process, it began in the mid-19th uh, century, uh, and it took root after the First World War, and its heyday was the, what the French called les trente glorieuses uh, uh, from 45 to 75, after the Second World War. Now, I mean, I think we don't understand, 
because we're immersed in it, how powerful uh, the notion of, of the nation is or of national community. I mean, it's so many different things. It's, uh, uh, it's a political community uh, g guaranteeing our laws and protecting us from adversaries. It's uh, uh, a territorial community. It's uh, the, 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 the area of land and sea that defines uh, the place. It's a, a community of interest. Ex uh, citizens are expected to have a common interest in trade and war and in other things. It's also a virtual community or an imagined community. The idea of the national body as a cultural construction of some uh, power and durability. And finally, and most important, it's a monetary community. Since the, the middle of the 19th century, uh, national capitalism has been organized through central banks managing legal tender through a national monopoly currency. We have an idea that the, I mean, our, I mean, most of us, if we think about money at all, imagine that it is something singular because the national frameworks that we habitually have lived through are symbolized by this one thing, uh, 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 the national money. Um, okay. Uh, I've mentioned already that... Uh, I mean, that national capitalism was invented through a series of political revolutions in the 1860s and early 1870s. All the major players in 20th century history, the United States, Russia, Germany, Italy, France, Japan, uh, Britain, all went through political revolutions in that decade. It was also the decade when Marx produced uh, capital. Uh, uh, and, and, and it was essentially based on an alliance between capitalists and the traditional enforcers, the landlord class. Remember that the bourgeois revolution was allegedly against the landlords by the capitalists with the workers somehow in tow. Uh, but this uh, uh, national capitalism and the class basis was essentially a, a class alliance between governments and businesses. Uh, uh, that took new forms uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, this became, in a fluctuating way, uh, the organizing principle of economy in the 20th century. Now, uh, this system, which uh, you know, more or less ended in the 70s, it ended, as I've said, when uh, the um, uh, uh, when the dollar went off gold, the following year, money derivatives were invented in Chicago. I mean, in the mid-1970s, just to give you some idea of the sheer scale of what has happened in the last 40 years, in the mid-1970s, almost all the money that was transacted internationally was used to pay for goods and services. There was almost no money exchanged directly just for money. Today, uh, I mean, just foreign exchange, I mean, uh, the turnover of foreign exchange uh, is now $7.5 trillion daily. And that's just money for money. In fact, the proportion of the international exchange of money uh, uh, um, uh, that is uh, for buying and, and selling goods and services is incredibly small now. So what we have is a global circuit that has become detached from national politics, detached even from trade, and which is more or less a self-sufficient circuit operating beyond the law of any national government and uh, often illegally through tax havens, uh, shadow banking, hedge funds, all kinds. I mean, there is, I mean, money has simply escaped from whatever it was in the post war period, the Keynesian consensus. And uh, we have a situation where 
uh, uh, politics remains overwhelmingly, at least notionally, uh, national, and the money system has simply escaped from any legal or political control by any known territorial entity. That's why, you know, I argue that national capitalism is more or less w washed up, and uh, uh, why, therefore, the period we're in at some subliminal level is a popular recognition that we can no longer uh, live off the assumptions concerning money that were normal in the 20th century. Um, now, there, can I have a few minutes? Okay. Um, um, now, I mean, one of the things that's driving this detachment of the money circuit, you know, is as you know, neoliberalism. It's the the premise that markets will flourish as long as markets and money are subjected to minimal uh, uh, political interference and legal and administrative control. I mean, that's the. Uh, uh, in other words, the neoliberals dream of um, uh, money without politics, markets without states. Um, and in fact, they share this dream with the techno-utopians that, um, that Nigel likes, you know, the Bitcoin people and so on, you know, who equally have this idea that what they want is a system of money with no politics in it. And, uh, uh, I mean, that, what happens when you imagine that the politics uh, has been uh, removed from uh, m the money circuit is that the politics goes underground and is less amenable to interference. So that, for example, um, the, the, the Bitcoin uh, exchange, uh, uh, Mt. Gox, at one point was controlling 80% of Bitcoin transactions. And you know, this, this means that it had more control over the currency than um, a central bank does over a national currency. And yet they were claiming that this was a form of money without politics. I mean, when they had a, 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 a uh, 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 um, uh, sell off of, of, of the currency, Mt. Gox had enough control to be able to limit the exchange and stabilize the price as around a certain uh, policy. Uh, but it's also the case that at the end of the Cold War, um, the Europeans especially had this notion that free market capitalism had won, and, uh, and, and they made two massive and irreversible blunders. I mean, first of all, they uh, privatized the Russian economy without making any attempt to institute effective legal or political controls over money. The result was gangsters and oligarchs got all the money, and, and we've got Put Putin to show for it. Uh, uh, but even worse, the Western Europeans uh, decided that they were going to acquire political union by creating a single currency, the euro. And once again, the logic is that markets precede politics. It wasn't like that before. I mean, when the Americans fought a civil war before they uh, nationalized their currency, the politics comes before the markets. But in this ideology, markets can be a sufficient uh, 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 means of achieving political ends, and it ends up in disaster. I mean, I've, I don't know when it's going to happen. I've made terrible bets on the euro already, uh, but, but I, I, I don't know when it's going to finish, but it will finish. But of course, as Keynes said, you know, in, in, in the markets, everything is... Uh, uh, timing is everything. <laughs> uh, now, I, ha we, I can only 
allude to, I mean, some of, I mean, this massive explosion in transactions involving money globally is unthinkable without the internet. In fact, the whole uh, uh, subprime crisis that was cooked up by Wall Street uh, uh, came from the fact that they understood the potential of the internet uh, for certain kinds of accumulation before, for example, the Europeans. So, uh, uh, um, th as I mentioned, you know, not only is the technology of money transfers massively accelerated and, uh, uh, and, and so on, uh, but also the legal frameworks for doing it, uh, tax havens, uh, money market funds, and all the rest of that. So, to conclude, this is, well, I, you know, I can't deliver in a short speech that enough to convince you if you don't like what I'm saying already. But um, I'm claiming that we are living through a turning point in the history of money. And this is something the seeds of which were sown in the early 70s. They may have been uh, exaggerated by, uh, uh, um, um, uh, they may have been um, exaggerated by uh, the Cold War, by the internet, by various other developments since, or by the, the crisis of 2008. But the fundamental issues driving global money and the inadequacy of local, national, political, legal frameworks for controlling it um, is something that's been building up for decades. And it may take some more decades before it um, is resolved. Um, okay, and I, men I mentioned, I mean, the reason why Piketty's book is, uh, is popular is because he's talking about inequality. He's talking about inherited inequalities of wealth. I mean, we're living in a society in which it becomes more and more obvious that, uh, that the opportunities that we believe citizens and their children had uh, are being removed by uh, uh, established and entrenched uh, uh, unequal wealth. Uh, so I think it's not surprising that people have a general interest in money today. I think there are many good reasons for being interested in it. And frankly, I mean, if you, didn't, if you don't have an interest in money, then good luck to you. I mean, you know, people ask me, why are you an economic anthropologist? And I say, because I want to save my family from the Holocaust that's coming up. <laughs> I mean, everything that I do as an economic anthropologist, I believe has a personal application uh, to me and my own. And I hope when I'm teaching that I can give people some sense that they can learn something useful in the management of money in their own lives. But basically, I mean, this idea of, of, uh, of money as God, I mean, is okay, it's a bit trite. Um, <laughs> Uh, the fact is, money is the ocean that we swim in. And when did you ever expect fish to develop a conceptual organization of their, or, you know, uh, of their environment? You know, we are stuck in this, in, 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 in this ocean that we would, can't possibly really understand. Except, as I say, I mean, I think it will take people time because it's a big book and it's a very complex book, but it's beautifully written and very accessible. The Social Life of Money of Nigel Dodd will at the very least, I hope, you know, make you feel uh, that you have a, a, a point of entry into this fascinating and extremely complex subject. There's a, there's a lot there as well. We've, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, and I think mainly aimed at Nigel, but I think Keith will also answer. You're, you're first up, sir. The microphone will come to you. If you could just say who you are and ask your question. Uh, hi, my name's James Irving. I have a question about, uh, and I appreciate that when people describe something as utopian, they often mean it's utopian in aims 
or utopian in precepts as opposed to utopian in res practical result. But uh, I, I just thought it's interesting to pick up uh, the question of Bitcoin. I think on your graph there, you had 25% of Bitcoins in the world, or they're about, about a quarter, are controlled by 47 people. Mm. Um, if one were to adopt Bitcoin, that would be, in effect, a massive transfer of wealth to a small faceless group of people, probably cryptographers and who, you know, we, we wish them all the success in the world. But um, uh, that doesn't strike me as utopian either in aims or in result. I'd be interested to uh, have your thoughts on that. Do you want one or two? I don't mind. I there, there was someone right by you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Stuart Theobald. I'm a PhD student in the philosophy department. I'm really interested in your idea of money as a process, and I, and I wonder what it's a process of. And let me suggest maybe that it's a process of shifting obligations and that what we normally think of as money, as physical stuff or bank records, is, is a representation of those obligations. It's uh, a record more than money itself. Um, OK, um, on uh, uh, the, the meaning of utopia is, is um, none place, not, not ideal world. Uh, so I think it's important when, when we think of uh, Bitcoin as a utopia or anything as a utopia is uh, not meant as necessarily a good place. So that's the, the first point to make. I don't know where, where Keith's picked up that I'm a fan of Bitcoin. Um, I thought it was fairly clear from what I said that I think the ideology underneath Bitcoin is um, a pile of excrement, to borrow Norman Brown's expression. Um, <coughs> What's fascinating about Bitcoin is that actually it comes to resemble, as Keith was saying, um, very much a almost a kind of uh, a, a national currency system on acid or, or on steroids. It becomes even more, and it, it reproduces inequalities to an even greater extent, or at least to the concentration of wealth in Bitcoin. It's very similar to the concentration of ownership of gold, for example. Not quite as concentrated as gold, but, but close to that. So, um, yeah, if the world was to become uh, a Bitcoin world, it wouldn't be a very pleasant place. But, um, you know, we can all go home then. Well, no, because, because what Bitcoin's done is start um, really drive a conversation uh, about money. That <coughs> Keith is a, is a you know, money obsessive and he'll be saying these things and has been saying these things since he was you know, small and, and me too. And I like money fetishists and, and I get on with them. But, but you know, for a long time it was kind of lonely. And, uh, and when I first started working on money, uh, there were just sort of, I remember meeting Viviana Zelitzer in Amalfi and we were kind of like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you too, you know, we're a couple of <laughs> alcoholics, you know. Because <laughs> um, it was just, you know, me and her and that was about it. And this was back in the early 90s. And, 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 uh, it w and, and a student of mine recently, I was telling her this story. She's actually here, but I'm not going to, uh, sh she'll know who she is. And, uh, and I told her this, you know, story about my career and said, you know, I've always been working on money and, um, I try and get away from money and I get dragged back and I just thought I was escaping and then bloody Princeton got me and they wanted a book. Although I love Princeton University Press, by the way. They're, they're, they're a fantastic publisher. And then she, she looked at me with sad eyes and she said, yeah, but it's okay, money's cool now. <laughs> I almost cried at that point. But, but Bitcoin's done that. I mean, Bitcoin's provoke that conversation about, about money. We had a thing in the Department of Sociology here uh, in January, a kind of Bitcoin meeting, and, and it was a lunchtime meeting. And normally those things are attended by a couple of colleagues and a dog and a sandwich. Um, and this was, you know, spilling out into the corridor, and people were coming in off the streets with mad staring eyes, you know, wanting to talk about Bitcoin. And so it has provoked a conversation. And what struck me is that that conversation is what sustains 
Bitcoin. It's not the technology. Uh, Keith's right. And so there is a kind of utopian aspect to it, but actually the people that are involved in it kind of don't kind of wake up to that. They're, so it's a paradox. They're, 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 they're driven by the dream of, of, a, of a, machi a machine dream of a currency that's completely free of social life, and yet they are the social life that's sustaining that currency. So I, I love Bitcoin in that sense, but not, not as a kind of vision. And, I, and, and that takes me on to the other question, which is what sustains money as a process. And I think, yes, it's a, it's a, a set of, of obligations that are passed around, but I think it's an awful lot more than that, um, depending on, on the kind of money that you're talking about. But I think money is sustained by interest, by desire, um, as much as by, by mutual transactions. Um, so, you know, by, by process, I, what I really mean is, is that money is underpinned um, by you know, the social relationships that, that support it. Um, and, and, you know, the, Marx uses the term fetish to describe the way that we think about money as, as, as this object that's outside of us and has really, you know, connection with us. And that's a very powerfully damaging idea about money because it just suggests to us that we, we have nothing to do with it. Um, and that's why I like the trillion dollar coin because although, in a sense, it's a very statist idea, you know, it did draw attention to the, to the sense that actually this debt was going you know, to just, you know, tick and, and it was gone. And that, that, that was kind of a powerful notion. Um, so that drew attention to me to the social obligations that sustain money. And it's not sort of the metal. And it's, not, it's, not the, 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 it's not stored up in the earth or anything like that. Uh, that so that's what I mean by, by money as a process. Great. So we've had excrement, fetish, cool, acid, and from... Keith Fish. We don't usually get this with Mervyn King when he talks about money. Let, let's go over here. Much more interesting. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gaius Vincent. Uh, about the same phase in my life that you were sleeping on four million pounds in hard currency, I was occasionally wearing about 200,000 in hard currency to smuggle it into was the, uh, before the wall came down in, into Eastern Europe to the trade union movements there. And I liked to think I was smuggling in a bit of power to the disempowered, but it strikes me now perhaps I was smuggling in a load of excrement, <laughs> which is a bit of a shame. <laughs> um, uh, other people, of course, very different people, were smuggling in Bibles, which uh, I dare say it's in your book, and um, I apologise if it is, but I think uh, someone was pointing out to me that uh, you were talking about translations, and that in the uh, Lord's Prayer that a lot of people might know, yeah. The accurate translation is probably not forgive us our trespasses, but forgive us our debts. And that would be hugely different in meaning going from uh, uh, a landlord phrase to a, what, what should we say, a sort of a counter capitalist phrase. Um, so, uh, where am I? Yes, a, a, myth that I, a myth that I was often brought up with um, or, or pro uh, told then at my uh, quasi religious primary school. I remember was about some merchant ships and a queen, I think, and um, that one merchant was bringing in a lot of gold and one was bringing in a lot of corn and the queen was pretty pissed off with the one with the corn who said he was so terribly important and it was all the gold, you know. And uh, the moral is vaguely obvious that the corn's, the corn's sort of useful if you're hungry and the gold's not. And um, I wonder, we seem to have reproduced exactly that because just in my own, I'm so sorry to talk about myself, but not really, but in my own personal <laughs> acquaintance, the poorest paid person, person in full-time work I know, are farm workers who produce food. And the best paid person I know is a bloke called Roger, whose work involves the law, IT, and banking reg regulation, and he earns millions every year, and that seems an exact analogy with that. Just wondered about that. And, uh, just on, on, on Keith's point about the euro, yeah, Keynes did also say in the long run we're all dead. And if the euro lasts another five decades, I lose interest, you know? <laughs> Thank you. One more? Yeah. Uh, well, there's, there's two guys there. See if I'm missing anybody. They Go upstairs. Bunch. Sorry. We, we'll, we'll take these two and then we'll, we'll come upstairs, yeah. Bruce, you go first. Um, yeah, Bruce Davis. Uh, picked up on yeah, the peer to peer lending piece. I was, I, I was, it's related to the utopian point um, that actually I might challenge the idea that peer to peer was a utopian idea that we wanted, but actually the opposite. Right. That what we're trying to do is embed money 
into society rather than take it out. So I am also not a fan of Bitcoin. I think it's a complete waste of time. Um, and, and a distraction from the real politics of money. And I guess the question is really, you know, why do you think it is that politicians always agree about money and not about anything else? So they don't talk about money. It's the thing that's not talked about ever. Is it because they don't understand it? Or is it they just they don't want to admit that they don't know anything about it? <laughs> 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 well, uh, sorry, Dave Birch. Um, actually, just on Bruce's point, I note that the, we, it turns out we have a minister for the digital economy, which I didn't know until this morning. And in a very British way, it's the noted art historian, Lord Vasey, who's <laughs> first, of course you would pick someone like this to be the minister for the digital And he says the government's keeping an open mind about Bitcoin, which proves conclusively that they don't understand <laughs> it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Bruce's point is accurate. Is that my question is, my question actually is for Keith uh, rather than Nigel. I mean, I, I don't want to embarrass Nigel any further by praising him about the book. But I think he won't mind me saying it owes a debt, as my work does, to Keith's book, yep. which in its time was, you're being far too modest, Keith, because your book was equally a landmark uh, in its time. And I'm curious about why the thinking about money hasn't evolved, because if you are, I'm why, coming, why the, why the thinking about money hasn't evolved, it echoes Bruce's point. It, it seems to me that there, there are people who've begun to think seriously about the topic and from my perspective, forced by the changes in technology that you, you alluded to, that forces us to think about it. And yet, um, at this kind of political level, the fundamentals of money are never questioned. That must change at some point, and I, I wonder what the triggers might be, or what future economists looking backwards will see as the weak signals for change around that. What's actually going to trigger some new thinking about money? Do you want to take those? Now, we need to do upstairs mm. as well. So. Yeah. Um, I, I, very briefly on, on Bruce, uh, the, the Zopa thing. I mean, um, I, I kind of agree with all I can answer to that. I don't have any, um, I don't see, um, the, the only thing is I, I, I don't think that we should start getting um, tribal about these things, really. Um, and, you know, we start saying, you know, we think Bitcoin's wrong. And, you know, I, I talk to a lot of um, monetary reformists, um, people involved in the Brixton Pound, supporters of positive money, um, people that are into Bitcoin or Dogecoin or Litecoin or Dodcoin or whatever other kind of version. And um, I, you know, I am you know, a committed pluralist. And so for me, it's a, that the more people are talking about this, the more I'm happy. And you know, I don't like to hear you know, anyone saying, well, you know, that's not really a, you know, a valid project um, and then kind of dismissing it and without any disrespect. I just think it's all part of a, a conversation we need to be having. Um, and, you know, this is the sort of, you know, you, if you talk to people from, say, the Brixton Pound about Bitcoin and initially that, mm, you know, it's really, and a lot of local currency people are kind of annoyed by Bitcoin because it's, it's sort of got this, you know, it's the cool thing. Um, but on the other hand, they know and they will admit that, that people are talking about their thing uh, that wouldn't be talking about it otherwise. And lots of interesting, kind of weird, hairy people, sorry, Dave, are, are you know, converging <laughs> on, on this. And I think that's sort of exciting. And, and, and Bitcoin's go, you know, going to go away in a sense that it's already moved on to Bitcoin 2.0, which I didn't talk about, Ethereum and Dark Wallet. If you really want kind of something spooky, go and you know, YouTube Dark Wallet. And uh, you know uh, th th their ad is fantastic, and that's just kind of you know that's Bitcoin's gone in that sense. It's off towards smart contracts, so uh, it's not really something to kind of worry about, you know. It, but something else will come on that for, for, for money that's behind it probably. And then for Dave's question, I'm really very happy that Keith's going to answer that. <laughs> well, um, I mean, Nigel is. He does a good job of disguising it, but he's an intellectual. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when, uh, when, I, when I said, you know, the, that he likes Bitcoin, I meant he likes it because he understands it so well. So that when he 
He always has a, a prominent place for Bitcoin when he's writing about money, not because he actually likes the project, but he likes the fact that he knows it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I, I can only say that because I'm the same. I mean, uh, so uh, this is very kind of you, uh, Dave, to, to talk about the book that I wrote uh, 14, 15 years ago. Um, I, on, on this question of timing, I mean, I mean, Keynes was at the Treaty of Versailles, and he said, don't hammer the Germans, because if you do, you'll destroy the European economy. And Lloyd George and Clemenceau decided to hammer the Germans. So he was extremely upset, and he went back and published the book on the economic consequences of the peace. And then he started selling the Deutschmark short. And, and But for some ridiculous reason, like the German banks, I mean, look what they're doing with the euro. I mean, the, 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 the Deutsche Mark stayed up uh, throughout 1920, and he was massively overexposed <laughs> on his short contracts, which he had to meet, you know, 10 times what he'd actually... And, he, you know, he, he was belly up, and his father, John Neville Keynes, uh, who was the registrar and professor of political economy at the University of Cambridge, uh, remortgaged the house to bail him out. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, and Keynes never bet his own money again. I mean, <laughs> he was the, 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 the bursar of kings and made it a very rich uh, place, but he was betting their money. Uh, uh, anyway, about, you know, about... about Three years later, 1923 it was, he was at a party in Cambridge, and this woman came up to him. By now, of course, the Weimar collapse had already occurred. She says, but, I mean, in the long run, you were right. And he said, in the wrong run, we're all dead. I mean, that's the particular. Uh, uh, so in, 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 in my own case, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I, I wrote that book, The Memory Bank, uh, because I had an LSE uh, uh, named lecture in the 80s, uh, the Malinowski lecture, and mm -hmm. I wrote it on money, and it was called Heads or Tails. And, uh, and I decided, you know, I wanted to write a book, and what should it be? And I thought, well, I had a bit of success with that lecture, so why don't I dust off, you know, my interest in money? Uh, but one of the things that, again, the timing of, of the reception of these things and whether the, there is an advance or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, at this moment, my 1986 lecture is more popular and widely known and cited than the book. Yeah. Now, I don't think the, the book is basically how did the digital revolution uh, alter the conditions of money and exchange which I think is, is, it is a, a more far-seeing book. Uh, but but the, the other article written in the middle of the shift from Keynesian to monetarist uh, policy, which is what it's about, the shift from state to market in the organization of money, I mean, you know, people can grasp what's in it uh, a lot more easily than, than this. And I don't think it's that, that people haven't made any progress. I mean, I have made a lot of progress in the last 10, 15 years in developing my ideas about money. And I even published some of it. But I think, you know, the, the question is really al alchemical, uh, how ideas kind of enter into, uh, uh, into public discourse at a certain time and, and whether people take them up and develop them or not. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually completely mysterious to me how this happens. Let's just take the two last, there's two people upstairs who want to ask a quick question. So you and you, yeah, and then. Um, it's more of a reflection, really. Um, I was interested in what you said about how, you know, things like Bitcoin or the gold standard and like they had a lot of potential for control um, and it, you know, which could lead to great inequality. But I wonder if one of the reasons they're also appealing is because even if they are controlled, at least we all know the rules and in that sense it makes us all equal. Money is a great equalizer because we all know the rules by it. And, once, and then I wondered what you thought, what happened if that is the case 
when sort of two worlds collide, when we start things, seeing things like Bitcoin being accused of being a, you know, a place for money launderers in the real world, for example. Um, any reflections on that? It's just right there. Yeah, you get the last one. Uh, hi, Nigel. Um, my name is William Wong. Thank you for uh, following me on Twitter earlier. Um, but also, congratulations for your amazing book. Uh, I just managed to read 10 pages on my way here. It reads like a runaway thriller, just so unlike any book of money. But, but less seriously, I should say, I'm in the process of launching a startup. It's really to talk about money, but via Instagram. And I'd love to have a separate conversation with you. Um, going back to your lecture earlier, you, you briefly mentioned we're not here to talk about financial literacy albeit that's very important. It's taken so many years, finally, financial literacy in some forms is now in the national school curriculum, yeah. in state schools in England, finally. Now my point here really is, I know your book is not about teaching people personal finance, um, the concepts are really important. How would you like to see the core thesis, the ideas embodied in your book, to be really more, I'm not saying it's not accessible, but the Princeton book is still a niche. How would you like to see it really rolled out across channels and media so far more of people in Britain and worldwide really think about these issues seriously and not just within the walls of the LSE Lecture Hall? I'd love to work on that. We, we need to get onto mass collaboration and thinking. It can't just be restricted to a few institutions. Then Nigel, answer that, and then I think we'll have to. Okay. Um, on on, on um, the Bitcoin question and the rules, uh, that I, I, I'm, I don't think with Bitcoin we do or know the rules. That's the problem. We sort of think we do, and um, it, it's the more I learned about. I mean, I just thought I understood Bitcoin, but I, you know, then you start talking to geeks about it, and uh, and they they kind of tell you all kinds of things that you didn't really understand and, and uh, so I don't think we do know the rules but I completely uh, agree with the spirit of, of your question um, and w as the world's colliding I think that is interesting because Bitcoin has been sort of scapegoated in this way that it's just basically for, 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 for money laundering and, and, and people to buy porn and drugs and so on um, which I think is unfortunate. Um, the thing that's interesting about Bitcoin though actually that's not kind of covered is that there's it kind of plays into a couple of uh, interesting discourses. Post-2008 is obviously one, the idea of taking money away from states and away from banks, tick. Also actually plays into a kind of post-2001 uh, discourse, which is taking finance, uh, the state control of finance, and, and answering that and saying, okay, we, you know, we're anonymous, you can't, although Bitcoin isn't as anonymous um, as one imagines. The, the discourse it doesn't get go into, and I can't get Bitcoiners to really address this because they know they're wrong, is the, the ecological side. You know that the, the huge amount of, of energy, and if you project through to to um, what's going to happen uh, if this currency really uh, carries on, it's it's really have quite horrendous. So I think there there are kind of um, interesting issues around that uh, that aren't being investigated. But the spirit of your question, I'm completely with it. Financial literacy, it's interesting that after the crisis at the, the, the FSA, Lord Turner, did this report, you know, and they came up with, a, you know, I know what we'll do, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that everyone's financially literate. It's, it, you know, they should start with the bankers, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I thought that was, you know, more excrement. Um, Financial literacy is interesting because, because I know people that work on this um, in, in, in Russia, for example. There's a colleague of mine, Olga Kutsina, and I've written uh, some papers with her. And, uh, and she, she does this, but you know, she's paid by all kinds of large organizations <coughs> to talk about financial literacy because why? Because the banking system in Russia is very underdeveloped and they really want to, Russians are you know, really bad savers and they want to, 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 to grab more um, uh, Russians uh, in, into the financial system. Financial literacy in schools, well, I mean, we, we have the, I <laughs> talked years ago about kind of fetal finance. We have this the financialization of the, of the baby in Britain when we issue <coughs> when with, with ISAs, you know, from the moment you're born, you, you're a financial subject. So I, I find financial literacy being taught in the schools potentially rather worrying because it's dragging 
um, children into the kind of nexus of, of the banking system. Um, and that's why I said we should be teaching them about money <coughs> and the meaning of money and the value of money uh, in a broader way. And, and <coughs> financial literacy can then, then be something else. You know, financial literacy, you know, how, you know, how to manage a bank account and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, great, perfect. But it's, it's a very narrow, technical, uh, and very useful as far as the banks are concerned kind of, kind of knowledge. So um, this is why I'd like to see you know, kids at school taught in a much more kind of adventurous way about, about the meanings of money, and, 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 uh, which doesn't preclude financial literacy. But I think if it was just limited to that, I, I would find that kind of disturbing and really a victory for the financial system, not, not a victory for for, for monetary scholarship or the broader public understanding of money. However, your point that we need to have this conversation outside of the LSE, I completely take. What I'm seeing is that that's exactly what is happening. I've spoken to more people beyond the academy this year, this last year or two years, about money, about the future of money. I've been invited to more events that are not academic conferences uh, and, to, you know, spawned up by more journalists than ever before. And that's not because, you know, I'm becoming famous or anything. That's simply because more and more people are interested in the future of money. And they're not academics. They're not economists. They're not bankers. They're, they're members of the, of, of the public. And they're, and they're coming from all over the place. And that's what I think is exciting. But we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> a very good note to end. And, you, know, you mentioned Brown. I think it was Freud who first said that money is to yeah. adults what excrement is to children. Yes. Um, and we've had you know, a wonderful discussion tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank LSE Public Events, of course, uh, both of you and all the audience uh, for being here. Just before offering a formal vote of thanks, I think we're all invited to drinks in the atrium afterwards. Those of you that want to uh, buy Nigel's book, and I think many of us will do, uh, want to do this after tonight's lecture, they're outside. If you get them and then bring them back, then Nigel will sign them here. Um, it's, been a, it's been a, that's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great evening. I think it's been wonderful, and thank you so much for doing this. It's been very nice as well for the sociology department.